If you're a regular viewer of my content, you're probably already way too familiar with my affinity for parachutes. In fact, I think one of the first things I ever said on a live stream is that if I worked for SpaceX, I would choose to work in the parachute department. Yeah, while most of you would probably rather work on just about any other part of the rocket, I'd go with the one that's slowly being phased out. But why? At a time when propulsively landing rockets are all the rage, how could something as old fashioned as parachutes still be any fun? Since the very beginning of spaceflight, parachutes have been chosen as the safest means to a survivable landing. And they still are the preferred method with the most recent additions to crew carrying spaceships that we see. These days, people in the space community are screaming for more power. Meanwhile, I'm over here like, shh, I'm trying to hear the wind inflate the canopies. It's not because I find more modern techniques of rocket recovery less thrilling. I mean, who doesn't enjoy watching SpaceX or Blue Origin boosters seemingly defy the laws of physics, especially when they don't. But there's just something sophisticated and graceful about parachutes that has always fascinated me, eventually driving me to put my own life on the lines for the sake of the magnificence they have to offer. I think I just love the way these bundled up sky blankets allow a doomed victim of physics an opportunity to hack gravity and cheat death. The engineering behind it is is, is really, it's, it's actually very beautiful because it's very, um, it's very passive. But the engineering challenges they present are just as intriguing. In fact, parachutes are considered to be one of the hardest parts of a rocket to work on, causing several major headaches for NASA in the past, but also for companies like SpaceX and Boeing in the present. The reason why parachutes, you know, they're, they're so challenging is, that is you're throwing out a piece of fabric at greater than supersonic speeds. It's really complicated. And that must be worth something, considering the fact that rockets are the tip of the spear when it comes to innovation. Space is a place uh, where infrastructure is built to support everybody down here on Earth. So today, it's my honor to introduce to you what arguably isn't, but should be, considered one of the most elegant pieces of technology available to date, parachute systems. And it's my mission that through this video, you will at least be convinced to appreciate them as well. Over the next several minutes, we'll go over parachute history, explain the science behind them, their different designs, how they operate, and finally, how they are currently being utilized in the rocket industry. So raise them up to parachutes, and let's jump in. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word parachute? Is it the iconic images of Baumgartner's 2012 record-breaking jump from the upper regions of the stratosphere, which has since been broken by the way? Or is it the relieving sight of the Apollo 13 capsule under canopy upon its return from a doomed mission to the moon? For most people, it's probably those insane base jumpers leaping off of tall structures. While the parachute has indeed been put to good use in a number of different ways over the years, the idea behind the technology has always been to accomplish one thing, increased drag to prevent a catastrophic impact with the ground. As skydiver, I'm relying on my equipment a lot, and I also have a part of responsibility to be aware of everything that can happen during a skydive, make sure my equipment is ready to jump and well maintained. But just because this objective is fairly simple and straightforward, the design and mechanics of parachutes are anything but. Parachutes are often mischaracterized as a timeless device that hasn't changed much since its conception. Nothing could be further from the truth. The loads that you can generate um, from that little piece of fabric are, are, just, are just phenomenal. And um, the way you stage those, those systems and, and deploy them is just unbelievably critical. The earliest depiction for such a contraption comes from an anonymous manuscript written in 1470s Italy. It shows a man hanging from a crossbar frame that is attached to a conical or cone-shaped canopy. For safety purposes, straps ran from the rods to the man's belt, although all would be for naught anyway, in that the design isn't large enough to provide any meaningful reduction in the rate of descent for a falling person. 
Just a few years later, in 1485, Leonardo da Vinci sketched a slightly larger and more sophisticated parachute design, replacing the cone with a pyramidal shape. Although never tested in his day, that history is aware of, his designs were later proven to work when put to the test in the early 2000s. Therefore, these crude Renaissance drawings mark the origin of the parachute as we know it. Over the centuries, several others redesigned and developed ways to slow a falling person. In the 1700s, Louis Sebastian Linnerman built devices to help entrapped occupants escape burning buildings. He is credited with making the first public jump in front of a crowd using such a device. Linnerman was the one who coined the term parachute to begin with. Para is Latin for against, and chute is French for fall. So put them together, and parachute literally means against a fall. In 1912, Austrian-born French tailor Franz Reichelt took a literal leap of faith from the Eiffel Tower wearing his silk wing parachute. He did not survive. And while a handful of people in the early 20th century were separately working the problem, the first patent of a parachute-like device wasn't officially approved until 1914, a decade after the Ohio and Wright brothers' first flight. Greenville, Pennsylvania coal miner and engineering student Stefan Bonnage was walking home one day from work and witnessed a plane crash that killed the pilot behind the controls. Realizing that aviation is the future, Bonnage pondered ways to make it safer. Sound familiar? Eventually, he came up with a contraption similar to an umbrella that the user wore around his waist and improved his design with each jump from his barn rafters, making it larger and larger to hold more air and thus further slow his descent. But in order to patent his new design, he would have to prove that it works. So it is said that in 1913, he jumped off a 15-story building near the patent office in Washington, D.C., and later out of an airplane, safely landing both times. I know, it's incredible. One would think it would create huge instability issues, but it worked. During the First World War, the U.S. Army was interested in Bonnage's idea due to their inability to replace shot-down pilots. However, the Army opted for a more convenient method that could be more easily stowed in a cockpit. The same year that Bonnage's parachute was patented, North Carolinian Georgia Tiny Broadwick, the inventor of the ripcord, became the first person to manually deploy what we would now consider a more traditional chute, making her the first person to skydive. So if parachutes are simple and boring, or perhaps just simply boring, then why did they take hundreds of years of struggle and pancaking to perfect? How complicated are parachutes, and how do they work? Well, all parachutes operate around the scientific principle of drag. Drag is the aerodynamic force that occurs when molecules in the air make contact with an object in motion and create friction. You experience this friction, or air resistance, every time you put your face through a moving car sunroof. So if a parachute is deployed while gravity pulls a falling object down to the Earth's surface, air resistance inflates the chute and it conforms to the shape it was designed to take. And while parachutes come in a variety of shapes and sizes, all are designed with an abundance of surface area in mind. So the more they inflate, the more surface area is exposed, which means more friction, or drag, which means the slower the descent becomes. This is the basic fundamental science behind parachutes, but we haven't even gotten to the complexity of their designs yet. Trapping air underneath a canopy to create air resistance while maintaining integrity, stability, safety, comfort, and maneuverability is a hard feat of engineering. It, it's really about you know controlling that load and that load path through the openings and the various mechanisms. For, for our space capsule, we want to help it maintain stability during its descent through the atmosphere. Uh, to do that, we are currently investigating what probe system to use, because that is going to be an extreme challenge for us. Over the years, parachutes have evolved into a series of different designs, each more suitable for certain purposes than others. The round parachute is the forerunner concept that allows for a less controlled descent. They don't provide any lift, like the wing of an airplane, but are ideal for cargo drops into designated DZs, as well as emergency descents for small planes. As history progressed, the round parachute underwent many improvements, one of which was the implementation of holes in the canopy, which allows for trapped air to flow through instead of around, decreasing oscillation and providing a limited amount of steering. Its newest ancestor, the cruciform parachute, is a more boxy shaped design that provides greater stability during turns and even less oscillation than its round predecessor. 
These have become the go-to solution for low-altitude paratrooper deployments in the U.S. There's also the pull-down apex parachute, which are commonly used as reserve chutes for their faster opening time and reduced sink rate, but can also be used for recreational parasailing. Ribbon and ring parachutes, like the ring sail and ring slot, are most used in the space industry due to their ability to deploy at supersonic speeds. Their canopies utilize gaps between separated sections of material connected by lines to leak air and prevent shredding. This is uh, an incredibly labor-intensive design, to say the least. But no matter the type of main chute being used today, many would be next to useless if they weren't connected to a smaller parachute used to deploy them. That's because main parachutes rely on the presence of wind to inflate. To limit the shock factor placed on the lines and material during deployment, and to reduce the likelihood of entanglement, parachutes are typically mounted on the side of a falling object facing upward or opposite the windward side in freefall. This side experiences a pocket of dead air because of its shielded location from the surrounding airstream. So a small pilot chute, whether it's spring deployed, mortared, or thrown by hand, is first ejected out into the airstream where it inflates and pulls out the main chute from its container. I've had one time where um, I thought about starting to actually do my emergency procedures. My pilot chute was still behind my back in my burble, so it wasn't catching enough air to actually pull, extract my main canopy. So by looking over my shoulder, I actually gave it more air, and this way it was able to deploy. There are also parachutes called drogue chutes, that are used to stabilize and slow an object in free fall prior to the deployment of the pilot chutes. You've seen these towed behind everything from tandem skydivers to bombs to drag racers and to people who apparently run too fast. Balutes are a similar concept, but are optimized for supersonic deployments at high altitudes. But what we like about that design is that it is almost completely tangle free and it has been tested to high Mach numbers with good stability. Copenhagen Suborbitals, a non-profit rocket team out of Denmark, has designed a few different types of drogue chutes to aid in their efforts of putting man into space. The final category of canopy design is the Ram Air Parachute, arguably the most sophisticated of the lot due to the many cells or pockets of air they contain. The Ram Air provides uh, aerodynamic lift force as opposed to just a parachute which is drag. Um, so you're able to have a much smaller piece of fabric um, stowed and you know, achieve lower descent rates for the size of and mass of fabric. Rectangular chutes are the first choice for skydivers and base jumpers because of their ability to provide forward movement and steering capabilities via toggles the user pulls with his or her hands. This is also the reason why smoke jumpers have switched to ram air over the round parachute in the last couple of years. Wings are another modified version of the ram air design that are used by paragliders and powered paragliders for the speed they provide. This is how a typical skydiving rig works. A main parachute and its slider is hand-packed by a skydiver, or packer, using a specific folding and rolling technique. First, it's tightly placed into a deployment bag, or D-bag, and then the parachute lines are neatly secured in place to the bottom of the bag using rubber bands. Once everything is secured in and around the bag, it is then placed into the lower half of a container, or backpack if you will, that the skydiver wears. The main's pilot chute is installed in a pocket at the bottom of the container for easy reach. Then the container is closed up and secured in place using a small closing pin that is connected to the pilot chute's bridle, slotting it through a looped cord. When the pilot chute is thrown into an airstream, that pin is released from the cord, allowing the container to open up and the D-bag with the main canopy inside is pulled out. Once the parachute begins to inflate, the slider that was packed into the parachute holds the lines together to prevent instantaneous openings. Us skydivers, we are actually trying to avoid hard openings. Those are really painful, they can actually break your equipment, and they can seriously injure you. So more often than not, we are actually packing our canopy so that it deploys slower. As inflation progresses, the slider slides down the lines to within reach of the skydiver's head. Be sure to keep the slider in mind, because later we'll be talking about the similar concept of reefing. 
A reserve parachute is packed into its own smaller container in the upper half of the pack by an FAA certified parachute rigger. If not used, it must be repacked every six months. These reserve chutes have spring-loaded pilot chutes so that with a pull of a handle release on the harness, they can be quickly ejected into the airstream and inflate. If a certain low altitude is reached going a certain speed, say a skydiver is falling unconsciously, an automatic activation device, or AAD, on the container can cut the reserve closing loop and deploy the reserve parachute. Some reserve chutes are rigged to automatically deploy if the main chute is cut. Implemented for emergency situations, a cutaway cord is all that connects a skydiver's harness to his main canopy. But that creates a problem. The weight of the skydiver hanging from a parachute would place too much tension on the cutaway cord that connects the two together. With so much weight bearing down on the cord, it would require an almost impossible amount of pull force to release it. So an elegant solution was implemented into the design of the rig the three ring release system. There are three metal rings located on each shoulder where the harness connects to the parachute risers. They reallocate almost all of the weight of the skydiver's body. Therefore, tension is taken off the cutaway cord that separates and releases them during emergency procedures. Because of this elegant solution using mechanical advantage, it only takes a few pounds of pressure to pull the cutaway handle, allowing the skydiver to effortlessly separate him or herself at a time of crisis. It's crazy to think that during those moments of hard jerky deployments and glide time under canopy with all that turbulent air, just a few pounds of pressure keeps you attached to your parachute. Base jumping rigs don't typically have reserve parachutes. These jumps are usually done at such low altitudes, there simply wouldn't be enough time for a reserve to open anyway. But believe it or not, parachutes are a very reliable form of technology. They're designed to inflate in almost every circumstance imaginable so long as they catch a little bit of wind, that is. Most people would never consider jumping out of a perfectly good airplane, but talk to most skydivers and they'll be the first to tell you that they trust their canopies a lot more than they trust those rickety jump planes. And most of the time, if you think about the injuries or accidents, uh, most of them are not really related to an equipment failure. It's most often happening when, uh, because of a bad decision of the skydiver. So now that we have you all caught up on the history of parachutes, the science behind them, their different designs and how they work, now it's time to apply what you learned to the exciting world of rockets. While the Soviet Union was willing to send a dog named Laika on an ill-fated one-way trip to space in 1957, the United States used a parachute to safely bring a chimpanzee named Ham back to Earth in 1961. During the days of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, NASA used parachute technology to recover their astronauts from space and splash them down in the ocean. Unfortunately, on the Soviet side, Vladimir Komarov became the first person to die in a space flight when his malfunctioning main braking parachute tangled with his reserve in 1967. The incident caused him to crash into the ground at 40 meters a second, or 89 miles per hour. The like parachutes, like the parachutes they, they, they look easy, but they are definitely not easy. Um, and, and for those that know the history of the Apollo program, um, it was actually one of the toughest things in the Apollo program was with parachutes. Um, and it was actually one of the toughest overall problems in the, in the, because they had so many engineers to put on the, the parachutes. Parachutes for spaceflight have to be bigger and more carefully constructed than their human-rated counterparts that are being used by, say, military fighter pilots. For the Apollo space program, NASA would also need eight of them to slow the command module down to 20 miles per hour for splashdown. So engineers performed 137 drop tests over a six year period to perfect the technology. The fastest capsule to ever re-enter the Earth's atmosphere was Apollo 10, coming in at 24,791 miles per hour and weighing just under five and a half tons. The command module's drogues were deployed at 25,000 feet up, going 320 miles per hour, and the much larger mains were designed to deploy at 10,000 feet while still traveling 160 miles per hour without shredding. And really, that's the challenging part. Designing, sewing, and stowing a lightweight fabric and its lines that can withstand the impact of a high-speed deployment while attached to a massive load. During the Apollo program, each parachute was made of a half acre of ripstop nylon fabric sewn together with two million stitches. The suspension lines were a mile and a half long end to end, and after a week of packing and using hydraulic presses to secure them in D-bags, the fabric was as dense as maple wood. 
Fun fact, only three people in the nation were qualified to pack them, and so they were not allowed to ride in the same car together in fear that the program would be crippled if they were taken out in a single auto accident. An electronic sequence controller, about the size of a cigar box, was needed to deploy the parachute system, which included a logic circuit composed of barometric sensor switches, time delays, and circuits to fire pyrotechnic charges, in other words, mortar cannons. This is how it went. First, the apex cover is jettisoned, then the mortars shoot two 13-foot drogue chutes into the surrounding airstream, slowing down and stabilizing the capsule. Then the drogues are cut to prevent entanglement, and three seven-foot pilot chutes are mortar deployed as well. Upon inflation, they deploy the three 83-foot mains by pulling them into the airstream. It was an elegant sequence of events that really put on a good show. And as Apollo 15 demonstrated, only two of the three mains were critical for water landings. Like the drogue parachutes, the main parachutes were reefed to prevent hard openings that could destroy them. Reefing has a similar effect as using a slider on a skydiving rig. Except that in this case, multiple reefing lines are attached around the lower edge of the parachute to prevent a full opening. Several reefing line cutters are attached to the parachute's skirt band and contained a time delay compound that fires a blade into the reefing lines, cutting them in sequence and allowing for further inflation of the parachute. Although slightly improved over the years with electronic technology, as demonstrated here by Copenhagen Suborbitals, these parachute recovery systems of reef line cutters and mortars are still in play today. Currently, there are three human-rated capsules in development that NASA is looking to use for future manned missions. And common for all of them is that they all use parachutes. The first is NASA's Orion spacecraft, which is being built by Lockheed Martin, and it's a six-person capsule primarily designed to launch atop the SLS rocket, also currently under development. Its purpose is to take astronauts to the moon and back under the Artemis program. Its parachute system is similar to Apollo's, but contains three additional mortar-fired chutes for the forward bay cover, which is separated from the capsule via pyrotechnic piston thrusters after re-entry. Once it's away, it leaves the two drogue chutes exposed so they can perform their job next, followed by the three pilot chutes that, in sequence, pull the mains from the back of the vehicle. And again, these are reefed in stages. These three mains are 116 feet in diameter, 265 feet long, and weigh 310 pounds each. All are made of a Kevlar nylon hybrid material, making them much larger and stronger than Apollo's parachutes. A second human-rated capsule in the works right now is Boeing's CST-100 Starliner. Its primary purpose will be to transport a crew of seven to the International Space Station, and it's designed to ride upon the Atlas V, Delta IV, Falcon 9, and Vulcan rockets. The parachute system is similar to Orion's, and in 2019, during a pad abort test, a pin that was used to securely connect a pilot chute to a main chute wasn't inserted properly, which prevented one of the mains from deploying successfully. One month later, the capsule attempted to reach the International Space Station, but due to an offset in the mission clock and Starliner's computers, the spacecraft had to make an early return, which it did with three successfully deployed main parachutes, landing it in the New Mexico desert. And the third human-rated spacecraft in development today is SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsule. The spacecraft is capable of transporting up to seven crew members to the space station or the moon, although most likely it will just stay in Earth orbit. And SpaceX is just days away from launching their first crewed mission to space in this new capsule. It's a goal the company has had since its inception in 2002. A huge contributing factor for this recent delay was due to, you guessed it, the parachute system. Crew Dragon was originally designed to forgo the parachute system entirely and instead use the same strategy the company uses to recover its boosters, propulsive landings. This would allow for more accurate landings on Earth and Mars than their parachute counterparts. However, in 2017, the plan was nixed for two primary reasons. First, there was the amount of time and effort it would require to qualify the Dragon for safety. NASA, being the chief financial investor in the Crew Dragon project, has a certain familiarity with parachutes and their reliability. I mean, they even contract with SpaceX for their Cargo Dragon capsules that already use parachutes. Meanwhile, propulsive landings, which have certainly been proven to work, have only been used for non-occupied vehicles over the time frame of a few years. Second was the technological hurdles that would need to be overcome. Red Dragon's landing sequence called for radially mounted liquid fuel rocket engines, known as Super Draco thrusters, to slow the capsule during freefall. 
Then, small landing legs would deploy out of the heat shield just prior to touchdown. Ultimately, the former was implemented into the system for abort scenarios only, but the latter was no longer worth the effort, according to SpaceX CEO and chief engineer Elon Musk. So, like its cargo cousin, parachutes became the go-to method for Crew Dragon landings. But even though parachute technology is tried and tested, that doesn't mean SpaceX is immune from the headaches of improving said technology for their human-rated capsule. You know, I often see a lot of comments about uh, parachute systems. You know, we did this, we went to the moon, and we did this back in the 60s. How come we're still doing this? Surely, surely this is, you know, we shouldn't be having any problems with parachute systems anymore. They should be easy by now. And just reiterate the fact that, um, you know, there's analysis and, uh, and kind of design will take you to a certain point. It's still, still very much a black art. It's also hypersensitive to, to small tweaks and changes. Just, just moving a tagline somewhere or a cutter somewhere can have you know, quite a large effect to the, the performance of the system and reliability of the system. Testing parachutes is hard because the science is purely empirical. There's absolutely no way to test them in a wind tunnel or the lab and expect the same results in the very real and chaotic conditions one would find in the atmosphere. There's lots of um, lots of rules that um, you know you can design to, but at the end of the day, um, it's one of those things where you just have to go out and test. Which is expensive, time-consuming, and a logistical nightmare. And parachute materials, no matter the type or purpose, also degrade as they're used requiring regular maintenance. So depending if you're landing on sand or landing on the grass, there's also uh, water that can affect your equipment, the sunlight, uh, are you packing inside or outside? So all these elements are affecting and wearing your equipment, including the parachute. For extra redundancy purposes, Crew Dragon uses four main parachutes instead of three like all the others, but in April of 2019, three of the four failed to fully deploy during a single out test, causing the load to slam into the ground. With NASA's help, SpaceX learned that they underestimated how much weight their parachutes could withstand, and so they began upgrading their designs to what is now called the Mark III parachute. The biggest difference between the, the Mark II and Mark III is uh, going to um much stronger lines in the parachutes. So uh, going from essentially nylon to xylon, and then there were some changes to the stitching pattern where the, the lines um, connect to the canopy, you've, you've got a stress concentration. And so you want to have just exactly the right joint to spread the load at the stress concentration where the lines meet the canopy. Over the past several months, SpaceX and NASA have performed dozens of drop tests with the Mark III designs. And now the first two astronauts are just days away from returning to space on an American rocket since the days of the space shuttle. If for whatever reason you are not a fan of parachutes and you're on team propulsive landing, fear not. SpaceX's next spacecraft, Starship, will do just that. And I can guarantee you they will never make the switch to parachutes for that massive system. It should also be noted that American company Blue Origin also has a human-rated capsule in development. It, however, is of the suborbital variety. But parachutes aren't just being used for human recovery efforts and rocketry, far from it. They're also being used for landing rovers on Mars, and they are the go-to recovery method for model rockets and sounding rockets. Parachutes were also used to recover the Space Shuttle's solid rocket boosters in the past, and since 2015, the United Launch Alliance has plans to use them to recover their first stage BE-4 engines of their Vulcan rockets known as the Sensible Modular Autonomous Return Technology, or SMART concept. It would require detaching the engine compartment from the tanks, using an inflatable heat shield to slow them through the atmosphere, and performing a mid-air retrieval, a proven technique that dates back to 1955, and first utilized to recover reconnaissance images dropped from satellites. But now that very recovery strategy is also being tested in the efforts to reuse an entire first stage liquid filled booster of an orbital class rocket because propulsive landings aren't feasible for smaller rockets like the ones used by Copenhagen Suborbitals or Rocket Lab. This year, New Zealand and US small sat launch provider Rocket Lab performed a test run of a mid-air retrieval using a simulation of their Electron Rockets booster. Recovery systems are, are one of the, you know, the most underrated um, or underexposed, I should say, uh, technologies within the space industry. You're scrubbing velocity quickly, but you're also re-entering the Earth's atmosphere quickly, so the air density is increasing um, rapidly as well. You, you want to use, you know, as much of the atmosphere to do the deceleration as possible before you go 
out and throw throw our main out. So we have, um, you know, basically separation systems, the same separation system that we use between stage one and stage two, carrying those loads. When the pilot chute comes out, um, you know, you, you have to make sure the risers are taut before the pilot chute inflates, because if the pilot chute inflates before the risers are taut, then you get this massive shock load. So, you know, you have to, you have to deploy the, the pilot in a, in a deployment bag. Once that pilot chute inflates, then it then create, it, it pulls a shear which pulls out another deployment bag, makes sure that those risers are nice and tight and uh, shares off that deployment bag and stages a nice drogue opening. So then you've, now you're under a drogue. So, uh, you know, get, getting the drogue out uh, in, a, in, a, in a really controlled manner, far enough out behind the stage, you know, that we, we're not in the wake of, of the, the flow field. You know, if you do that wrong, you, you, you can end up two to three X, you know, your, your, your shock load um, forces straight away. And, you know, you can't design structures to carry four times, you know, the load easily. And they pull out, once again, a main chute in a deployment bag and the risers go taut, it's all staged, and you strip off that deployment bag. And then the main chute is reefed. So the main chute is not, um, is not able to fully open. Uh, so there's multiple reefing you know, stages to that chute and the chute, is, the chute is held reefed for a period of time to, you know, to lower the loads and then they cut the first reef away and, and you know, allow for a little bit more inflation, a little bit more deceleration and cut the final reef away um, to end up to your terminal velocity, at which point you're at about 10 metres a second and, um, and sort of 6,000 feet off the sea. And that's the thing I love about our parachute system so much is, is it, just like I say there, it all just happens passively, like there's still mechanical sequencing, very, very elegant. So Flight 17 later in this year, uh, BQ3 uh, this year, will be where we attempt to, uh, to actually fully recover a vehicle, go and pick it back up and stick it back in the factory. The parachute is a sophisticated piece of aviation technology that has not only withstood the test of time, but has adapted to the ever-growing demand for human exploration. Invented centuries before man even took flight, its design has been adapted to both save lives and end them. To provide a sense of security and a feeling of excitement, they have given humanity the opportunity to venture out into the solar system and to return home. And as the years progress forward and we see an increase in the use of propulsive landing technology, parachutes will still be around for those who dare to press further and those who appreciate their intricate beauty. I'd like to thank Peter from Rocket Lab, Mads from Copenhagen Suborbitals, Catherine from the YouTube channel Skydive Vibes, and NASA for their contributions to this video. You can find their information in this video's description. I also want to thank my eccentric members and patrons for their generous support that makes videos like these possible. If you enjoyed watching, please consider supporting this channel using the links below.